Oh, they do, but it's not. Again, it's not going to happen. How most think, but what I do with my experiences, and it's probably with yourself and a lot of people in this field. You know things and you don't know how you know them. And I call this is because of a download. Um, but I've had snippets of what I call this download with some of the stuff she you showed me, and it makes me think I'm on the ball with it. But even if tomorrow. The White House or the UN or whoever said that this is the real reality, this is going on, the amount of cleaning up we would have to do here before we even had an interaction on a civilization level would be would take years to get to the point to where we can do it in terms of energy and um, law and order and basically tearing up the bloody electrical grid and going to free energy. Um, to fossil fuels, it's like as if all right, the the reality would be known and we would probably see a bit more activity in the skies, but the actual interaction level uh, wouldn't be happening on a global scale for years, not heaps of years, but it would take time Um, and it would have to happen slowly in terms not to shock our civilization because at the same time, because when this happens, it will be in service mode because the service mode beings will take over it's got to happen in terms not to shock us because they still want us to keep our ways about us too. So it's got to be done, got to be done really slow. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of where I'm at with that, that type of thing at the same time. Yeah. Um, I think we are growing up. I think it's, it's time to know a lot of this. But in saying that, there are people behind the scenes yeah. like myself and other experiences that – we are having full-blown contact. So it's really happening right now. It's already happened. But for those that are ignorant and they don't look outside their box and they don't want their paradigm shifted because they think they know it all, this is where they're going to be shocked. But at the same time, there is going to be a conscious change where it's going to be like a light switch is turned on and they're just going to know at the same time. But in saying that, we do have to clean up here first. But it's, it's a multi-layered thing and we're not just talking about um, one race here or a handful of races, like we're talking about, you know, so many races that are involved with this. And I haven't, I don't know of any galactic federation or anything, but I know of councils. And I know of the, I know that the Andromedans are working with the Syrians and the Pleiadians and the Orions, different factions. I know that the reptilians, I'm actually going to be in a documentary coming out soon called Don't Mention the Reptilians with David Icke and Mary Rodwell. Um, I've had a few experiences there, but. Even with one of my interactions with the reptilians, they were showing me how they're breaking up into factions because they can't evolve and they're sick of getting the rap that they're getting. And some of it's deserved, some of it's not. But them too, yeah. they're trying to break free from what they've been limited because they're actually not that bad. They've actually been possessed by an archonic force behind them and they're used as a vehicle. Well... I just want to say that it's it's an honor to be here with P- Peter Slattery from Australia, and we agreed to have an an interactive program where the first half of the program Peter is going to share with us the various contacts that, that he's going to have that he is having, and the second half of the program. I will share uh, sort of the background from an exopolitical and also from an omniverse point of view. And that way, we, we, which is more of an analytical and an exopolitical framework. And hopefully we will have covered both halves of the equation. <laughs> so, Peter, please, I, I'm, I'm really very, very happy to learn of your contacts that you're very close to Mary Rodwell uh, there, who's a, who's a close friend and a colleague uh, of, of mine. She's been here in my home here. So I, uh, I please tell us all about, about how did you get started in, in, in this and what are the contacts that, 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 that you are happening, that you are having and uh, what are they telling you, and where's all this going? All right. Um, all right, I'll try and put it in a nutshell as, as much as I can. 
Uh, my experiences started at, at quite an early age. Um, I can remember waking up and there would be what is typically known as a grey, but it would be like a whitish ash colour. Um, yeah, so I started having interactions uh, between the ages 8 and 12 right. um, with something in my room. Later I found out these these types of beings uh, work for the Council of the Whole. So they, they're in service mode. They're not your typical sort of... Um, what people refer to as the evil greys or whatever. And there's about uh, 12 races of greys that I know about. So when people talk about the greys, um, what, you know, which ones are they referring to? Uh, around 12, I saw my first craft. It was about three times the size of a football field. And um, it was when I walked from my dad's house because I'd moved there at the time and it came past uh, a hill known where I was living at the time in Albury, New South Wales, Australia, as Red Light Hill. Um, from there, on and off, I'd have paranormal experiences, seeing shadow men, uh, seeing objects move. Uh, 2004, I had another sighting. It was actually a daytime sighting in the afternoon with a friend of an object uh, over the suburb of Glen Roy next to Lavington in Albury. Um, I was a rap artist also. I bought out 14 albums, and I did that up until around 2009, which I bought out a couple of albums after that that were already recorded. But 2010, I would I'd left Albury and came back to Albury, and that's when the activity really got started. Um, in two weeks, I had six sightings with a friend. Um, I, some of these are recorded and up on the website for people to watch. Um, at the time, it was just very full on. That's all I can say is that, you know, to have this going on and then a, a person witness it with me uh, who's actually had another couple of sightings since that time. Uh, like one of the objects you can see me point at it and it just shoots off. That actually got on uh, national news, shown around the country in 2010. Um, around that time I was conducting paranormal investigations and logging UFO reports because nobody in that area was doing that uh, between Melbourne and Sydney because I was sort of in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then 2011 was when it really got very interesting. Uh, I started to go out. I knew when to go outside. I, I call it thought transfer and actually in the video I recorded of a craft last night with witnesses out the back here, which is already up on my website and YouTube. Um, you can hear the bloke that I, I knew something was going to happen. That's why I had my cameras out the back while we're eating dinner outside. And he's turned to his right and saw this craft coming over. And you can hear uh, one of my friends and he's laying in the background saying, how did you know to look up there? And I'm saying to him, he knew because of thought, what I call thought transfer, that it wasn't his thought. He thinks it's his thought, but it was a thought projected to him to know to look up. And that's what I had around 2011. It took me a bit of time to understand because I've started getting thoughts and concepts in my mind that were just not me. And everyone around me is a testimony to how much this has changed me uh, for the better. And that's, you know, I get a lot of questions about how do you know if what's happening is good or bad. And I don't see good or bad. I see service mode or self-service mode. But I look at the fruit from the experiences. So if they enlighten me, they make me want to be a better person and more loving and caring and, and look at the world to want to help people, I see that as a good experience. If I'm sort of a bit shook up or a bit terrified and I get marks on me that hurt, I look at that as a negative experience, which is usually military. Um, I do have videos and photos of stealth grey helicopters, black helicopters. Um, I do have people that are known super soldiers here in Australia that have seen me on crafts with them and I can remember bits and pieces of that too. Um, I think that a lot of people usually have targeted military type stuff if um, what you, what's going on is you know something major in terms of uh, evidence wise and, and information that you're getting because usually they want to throw a few red herrings in there so you don't even know what to make of your own experiences in the beginning and then you sort of pick up on that and, um, you know, it, it, it just continues to today. Um, later on in 2011, these days, oh, it was a light blue light being, it was like a liquid blue light and I've seen these beings a few times since and... Um, I know them as the Elohim, and they said they're not angels, but that we perceive them as that, but they're, um, they're just highly evolved. It's like, but there's beings that are two, three times more evolved than them. 
but they are liquid light. They say that they're from the fifth, and they're they're stationed the group that I'm interacting with in part of Orion. Since then, I know that there's others that are exactly the same that are in Sirius and throughout the universe in different areas. So it's like there's different councils of them. Um, I've been in what I surmise is a craft with them, which is like a crystal cave with a pulsating light. Um, there's no entrance or exit. The whole thing's just like a dome and a flat ground, but it's crystal. Sort of like, I don't know if it's quartz, but it's like that and see-through and there's a pulsating light in it. Um, around that time, a, a being I started interacting with who told me that her name, well, reference for me was Shiji. Um, I've talked to Anya Briggs and a few others about this and it's sort of not your typical sort of, um, you sort of being from the Pleiades, for example, later on I was, she showed me her true self and it's not a she or a he and her name's not even she, it's just a reference point for me but it's a light being and it's like a brilliant, beautiful white light. Um, sometimes she'll interact with me and she looks completely human but just huge uh, wraparound eyes like ours with the blue bits and the, and the pupil and the white background um, and other people have actually had interactions with her as well which I just absolutely laugh at when it happens because how it happens they um, like one mate was using a chainsaw and clear as day he could hear her talking in his head now today she does pure thought transfer but back then when she started interacting with me, it would actually be like an English voice, no accent, no English accent or American accent or Australian accent. It was like a neutral um, verbal English uh, language and it would be like as if there was a speaker in the middle of my mind and it would vibrate out to my ears. It was sort of like it was too much telepathy. Like that was done by telepathy. It wasn't verbal but it was like she had to communicate that way until I was willing to accept it another way and when I've interacted with her a lot of time it's physical like as if you were here in this room I could touch you she's even touched me but now I'm surmising this is sort of like a projection type thing because even though it's real and I could touch it her true essence is light um, and I've been on her crafts where the the disc her and the beings with her were all even myself was a liquid uh, white white light with a tinge of blue to it and they were showing me how the craft's created by thought and they created this as a group, as a unity and that they, the craft protects them from other vibrations when they're together. They sort of feed off each other um, when they come down vibration to protect them from other environments when they're dropping in and out. A lot of the work they do, especially with the Elohim, they can do from their own vibration and wherever they are. But they'll sometimes use other beings to do work like um, the, some of the greys, which are actually brown from Orion, they're sort of the in-between and, and sometimes they'll take me to do work on my physical body. But sometimes my crew from Orion, which I was found out later I've, I'd been Orion, they would take my light body and do work on that as well. And then them and the greys together would do, would try and tune it so the spirit and the body are vibrating together because they've got to up one, then they've got to up the other, but it's, it can't be too much. Um, but they, the Elohim showed me that I'm from a, I'm from a rainbow being race there that do appear human, but they showed me a lot of other things too, which I wrote about in my last two books, Operation Starseed and Breaking Free, which is that some of the beings that we are interacting with are us in the future. Some of us go underground. Some of us stay on, on the surface to survive. What they showed me was sort of like solar events. Now, it's pretty trippy because Dan Burrish, I don't know him anything, but him and a few other people have talked about similar stuff that I'm talking about, which I didn't know until after I wrote the book, and I sort of just blew out because it's almost the same information, which to me, either they're, they're in the know or they've got some interaction going on, like Dan claims, because some of the beings that stayed on the surface went to the Pleiades in Orion, and they stayed human. They look human. Um, and they became spiritually advanced. The other ones didn't, and some of them went to Zeta Reticuli. Some of them put outposts around the solar system and surrounding galaxies to try and work out a way to come back and fix what had happened. Um, but in saying that, some of the Zeta Reticuli beings, they're not a problem with, but then some of them are actually... i sure that Dan Burris says, and that is that 
on on the timeline that we're on now, we're on a catastrophic timeline. Is that what they're saying, or we're on a positive timeline? No. What? I, no. What? What I got, which is really trippy, is that I saw. Uh, just before the end of 2012, they showed me two timelines come into one and that it was create your own reality time. Now, what came with that was that there was bits and pieces of both timelines that could have been. So um, what we could have say is the not so good timeline with the good timeline, there will be bits and pieces put in together, but it's still up to us. Now, in saying that, I kept on having this stuff the last... Right. Chapter I had to add the last chapter to one of my books called um, My Awakening Part Two, and it was almost like revelations after I got the information from Shiji. But I didn't see it when writing the book at the time, and I've read the book and I've gone, "Geez, this is almost like revelations." So I wrote, went back and wrote a last chapter, sort of putting it together, going, "People, you make up your mind." Right. Because this is just you know come to me when reading the book. Um, in saying that, uh, with since 2012, there has been an awakened consciousness, but also bits and pieces from both timelines to come together, but it, it is a create-your-own reality time. Now, I know from now up to 2016, there is going to be a shift like people can't even imagine. In, in saying that, Shiji kept on saying to me that it's not going to happen how most think in terms of like this shift or, you know, 2012 doomsday or the Galactic Federation is going to come down and land and everyone's going to get on ships that just... It wasn't how it was going to happen. But what I did see was something really weird. Um, and this happened at the start of this year. And I sometimes now I'll just sit down and I'll go quiet, not even meditate, and I'll be with my eyes open. and I'll get okay. hardcore third eye activity like as if I'm seeing you now. And it's almost like a screen projection. Um, and what I saw was this, but I've got to explain something to you first. Now, we've got, like Mary Rodwell, she's very perfect at explaining this. You've got the oversoul, which I've been shown, and then you've got offshoots, which could be your fingers. And all these are your different lives, living lives at the same time. Well, in saying that, just say this one here's Orion. This one had to split itself up and make two offshoots. So another two, like another life actually had to split off from this one, not two, actually one life had to split off and come here to Earth because not all the human body at this time could handle the full spirit of that one offshoot life. So part of me still in Orion living, I've interacted with it and I've seen it and then part, part of that's reincarnated down here. Where, where this comes into what I'm about to tell you is this. I was shown that the shift has already happened and it's continuing to happen. Those who are ready to go to the new earth have actually already gone there, but they don't even realize it. Those who are ready, their spirit has split in two. And the other half, the new, the bit that split off from the part that they think is them, has already gone to the new earth. The other part of them will stay here and live out that life, but at the same time, this isn't happening to everyone. Those who are left here, um, it's up to them what they do with the realization of what's going on in terms of this shift in consciousness. A lot of things are going to be exposed like what you were exposing and what you were trying to get out to the world. A lot of this is going to be seen for, and it is by the day being seen for what it is. A load of crap, corruption, um, manipulation, all that's being seen for what it is. And, you know, you still talking to the average Joe, they see how we're sort of being screwed now. And people, you know, they're not doing much about it, but as it builds up, more's being done. So in, in saying that, Everything's not everything, but a large majority of what's going on is going to be revealed to the populace on a conscious uh, level. It's not going to be over the news and this and that. It's just going to come out that it's like a light switch is turning on. They're going to be aware. The other lot, it's going to happen to them too, but their spirits split off and they've gone to this new earth. Now, I've seen the new earth, but what gets me is whether it goes into what you're talking about, whether it's the same earth we're on now, but a different vibration or whether it's actually another Earth, that's what I'm trying to get to. But I don't think it matters because it's just the information and my experiences that matter and helping support those that are having right. the same thing. And they ended up sort of looking like greys. In other words, humans ended up looking like greys. And then they came back from the future to now to see if they could avoid that catastrophic event. Okay. Well, this is where it gets weird because you're exactly right. 
Now, in, in saying that, the information about the yeah. greys and that that you just said, that's exactly what is very similar from Dan to myself. What's weird, what's weird is that it's not all the same, but that's something that I was saying that Dan Barish had said that is similar to me that, you know, sort of makes me think he's in the know or in the loop or something. The, the other part of that yeah. is, is that I was shown that even I though see. what I've just told you about the two timelines coming together, even and we've created a new timeline, even though that's happened, the other timeline still exists. And they're coming back trying to help. And this is where I said to them, I don't oh, get yeah. it. And they said, because yeah, I think yeah. linear. Now, people can go and watch a full regression that Mary Rodwell did, and I can't remember half of it because the beings actually come in and speak through me to Mary. So you might be able to get a bit of information from there. Are, are there any communications that, that, that these entities especially tell you? Where can people get your books and, and uh, all, of these, all of these communications that you're talking about? Uh, my books are available on Amazon, but you can go to my website and get them through Barnes & Noble as well. Um, you can get them at the iTunes bookstore and you can also get them at lulu.com. I see. Um, my website is petermaxwellslattery.com. Um, and mo like basically everything's done in a timeline. Everything, almost everything that has happened to me or my experiences, they're logged and timed and dated. And basically the books are going through a timeline of you're living my journey with me when you read my books. Um, with that, there's photographic evidence, there's video evidence. I've got over 100 witnesses now to events with me or around me at the time. Right. Um, like even last night, I was filming crafts. The night before that, I filmed crafts. I see. Uh, for three months, I lived with a good friend of mine who was oh, a former scientist for the CSR IRO here in Australia. And Mary Rodwell just lived a couple of blocks away from us. And Mary's really great friends with him, him and I. And I was basically sort of doing what James... Um, Gilliland does from there and my mates actually mates with James and live with James for three months as well funny enough so I spent three months with this bloke and this bloke live with James for three months um, and there's videos where you can see the crafts interacting with lasers um, even this stuff for example where the crafts will land on us and the atmosphere and the sound will change but then you'll walk away and you can actually see a craft shimmering out um Lots of time, even now, being in Melbourne now, um, the being sort of just, there's smoky stuff around all the time. So it's like my awareness from the time I spent there has everything sort of picked up. But my interactions are ongoing. Um, there's cat-type beings from Sirius that I interact with. Uh, the Pleiadians and the Orions I still interact with. Now, in saying that, with the crafts, um, it's just something that I know what's going to happen when it's going to happen, but also I can initiate it. So long as, um, like James says, you've got a loving heart and, and good intent, this is possible. People have seen it with me created over and over. It's not a fluke. I've taken out time and time after again. We've got the satellite trackers. We've got the, and they're not satellites. We can see them power them up. We can see them split. Um, we can see them change direction at a dime. We can, I've filmed them past the space station. I've filmed them going past planes. Last night, we had three planes in the sky, and I'm filming it. So this is stuff where people go, the evidence isn't out there, or I'm full of crap. They haven't, they haven't looked at my evidence. They've already got their mind made up. But all this evidence is there, but the interactions is small. If I need to know something or... Like Mary says, if I need like a shaking up in terms of if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, they will come through. And it won't be to, to tell me because we've got free will, but it will sort of be like a bit of a wake up. Um, sometimes I, I do just hang out with these beings. Um, and recently I've started doing guide sessions where I bring in people's mm -hmm. guides. Which About the transitions that we're going through now. What I can say that about that and everything that I've, I've got to say is out there too, except, you know, since the last book. So everything I've experienced, even when I was abused as a kid, everything is in those. I've gone, I've put everything out there. But in, in terms of pertaining to the information you're talking about, um, what I do know is that 
since last year, we've had a thing where the feminine and the male energies are starting to line again. So what we've had, just right. in terms of that, within us here, we've had a bit of friction. Men are like, what the hell is going on here? And so are women. And they're fighting, but there's no reason. They know there's no reason for them to be fighting. They don't know what they're fighting about. But it's because the energies aren't in line at the moment. They're trying to go like this, like be straight, but they're going like this because they're going back in line again where they should have been the whole time. Um, so this isn't just a, a, a local energy. It's a universal energy within the, gal the galaxy, within the universe where it's at. And people could talk about this 26,000-year cycle or whatever they want. In saying that, we've got um, right. huge right. activity happening from the sun with solar flares. So this is, this is always a thing that's going on. But even lately, I was telling people about the solar flares, watch the solar flares, and they're ringing me back up going, geez, I'm not right, this and that. And I said, well, what have you been you know, doing? And they're telling me, and I'm like, well, have you, I told you about the solar flares, and they're like, what? And I said, well, they're electromagnetic freight field coming right. off. And it's scientifically known that even um, from the paranormal investigations I used to do, that EMF, high EMFs can make you paranoid, can right. make you hallucinate, can make you feel fatigued, all these things. Now, with that, plus with the energies, people are sort of knocked off balance at the moment. In saying that, these things which we can call archons, and there's many different levels of them, it's like we're already knocked off balance, but these buggers come along with their farm like as if you've got a bullet wound and they stick it in your wound just, to, just because they can. And what's going on at the moment in terms of this shift, when those who are ready to move up in this shift go, beings in, throughout all the planes and dimensions go up and there will be new ones created, created within right. a, like a, the resonant frequency, another vibration will be created for those up at the top. So we're trying to drag these guys along. For, it's like doing something for a child right. for their own good. Now, there's still free will. Right. But this shift is happening whether they like it or not. And they want to use us as a power source. Well, guess what? In the next vibration, they don't need a power source. They'll be break, breaking free, which is the last term, like the last name of my last book, breaking free. And it's not just about humanity breaking free. It's about beings throughout all planes and dimensions breaking free and that our only limitation is us. We limit what we can do. And we're actually unbounded. So up to 2016, this is going to be a pinnacle point where... Things are going to become undone, but to, to get to the good stage of everything where we're going, we have to go through a bit of turmoil. So a lot of corruption and crap's going to be brought to the surface like it already has started to be brought to the surface. Um, people are waking up, you know, whether they want to say spiritually or consciously, um, but these, these earth changes, which we could refer to, which in, actually are solar um, system changes and galactic changes and are universal changes, basically, mm. I'll say around 90% of what I've written and everything is from Total Recall. 90%. That's what's different. And it's been, a lot of it's daytime interaction too. It's not just nighttime stuff. So, and people have seen this with me. Mm. Um, I do have a recollection of um, my other life in Orion, which is coexisting. Well, really, all these lives are happening at the same time. But I've got memories of Pleiades, a bit of Sirius, and Orion. And there's a place where I've got no clue where it is, but it's like a crystal city with like the aurora borealis going off above me. And we're like white lights. Wow. The beings that live there. Um, there is still plants and stuff there, but different from here. Um, in Orion, the, the place that I'm from there is um, the sky is like a, a purple and it's really cloudy, but it's real rainforesty and real um, humid and it rains on and off. But the plants there, like flowers are like this big, like tulip type things and everything's really fat and, and uh, lush, really nice and green. Um, my life in, in, in the Pleiades... I can remember being around a heap of palm trees and I lived in this huge metal ball and it's almost like a caravan, but it was self everything was in it. Um, everything was self-contained, but it was the size of a two-story house. It's this huge metal ball. And both right. there in Orion, all I ever wanted to do was tell people to go away and if they had to see me, come and see me, but otherwise just stay away. So I've got recollection of, of those types of lives and... 
little little snippets come in and out. But I think if I knew too much, I I'll just want to leave here and go back home to whatever life I've got coexisting at the same time. So, yeah, I've got I've got snippets, and even with Sirius, um, with Sirius, it's basically like Egypt, but in a rainforest. Everything's gold and there's pyramids and there's statues everywhere, but everything's almost like a rainforest and really nice and it is a bit like mm-hmm. Earth. What I do remember, um, what's even funny is my partner mm-hmm. now, she's a, um, a psychic over here and she's a fellow experiencer and she's interacted with a lot of what she's seen with me and she's only started really seeing the crafts mm-hmm. physically. Uh, we've been together for three months, which is all mm-hmm. not a couple of months, which is why I left Queensland to be with her down in Melbourne. Um, she's from Sirius as well, and she actually speaks Syrian star language. Right. Got, um, right. Her name's uh, Sol Rita Antari, Sol, Sol Psychics, Sol Psychic Readings dot com. She does little episodes, and you can actually hear her speak Syrian star language. Oh, they do, but it's not. Again, it's not going to happen. How most think, but what I do with my experiences, and it's probably with yourself and a lot of people in this field, you know things and you don't know how you know them. And I call this is because of a download. Um, but I've had snippets of what I call this download with some of the stuff Shady showed me, and it makes me think I'm on the ball with it. But even if tomorrow. The White House or the UN or whoever said that this is the real reality, this is going on, the amount of cleaning up we would have to do here before we even had an interaction on a civilization level would be would take years to get to the point to where we can do it. In terms of energy and um, law and order and basically tearing up the bloody electrical grid and going to free energy. Um, to fossil fuel, fuels, it's like as if all right, the, the reality would be known and we would probably see a bit more activity in the skies, but the actual interaction level uh, wouldn't be happening on a global scale for years. Not heaps of years, but it'll take time. Um, and it would have to happen slowly in terms not to shock our civilization, because at the same time, because when this happens, it will be in service mode, because the service mode beings will take over. It's got to happen in terms not to shock us because they still want us to keep our ways about us too. So it's got to be done, got to be done really slow. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of where I'm at with that, that type of thing at the same time. Yeah. Um, I think we are growing up. I think it's, it's time to know a lot of this. But in saying that, there are people behind the scenes yeah. like myself and other experiences that – we are having full-blown contact. So it's really happening right now. It's already happened. But for those that are ignorant and they don't look outside their box and they don't want their paradigm shifted because they think they know it all, this is where they're going to be shocked. But at the same time, there is going to be a conscious change where it's going to be like a light switch is turned on and they're just going to know at the same time. But in saying that, we do have to clean up here first. But it's, it's a multi-layered thing and we're not just talking about um, one race here or a handful of races, like we're talking about, you know, so many races that are involved with this. And I haven't, I don't know of any galactic federation or anything, but I know of councils. And I know of the, I know that the Andromedans are working with the Syrians and the Pleiadians and the Orions, different factions. I know that the reptilians, I'm actually going to be in a documentary coming out soon called Don't Mention the Reptilians with David Icke and Mary Rodwell. Um, I've had a few experiences there, but. Even with one of my interactions with the reptilians, they were showing me how they're breaking up into factions because they can't evolve and they're sick of getting the rap that they're getting. And some of it's deserved, some of it's not. But them too, yeah. they're trying to break free from what they've been limited because they're actually not that bad. They've actually been possessed by an archonic force behind them and they're used as a vehicle. How would you characterize? How would you characterize what? what the archons are. Well, I've even got photos of one type and it's almost like a deformed fetus with no legs, just arms. I've got a photo of um, Now, what I get is, the best way I can describe it is I think in the Quran they talk about different levels of demons and then different levels of angels. If I've, I've probably got it a little bit wrong, but they talk about different levels. Well, with the archon network... There's different levels and there are different forms of existence. 
Now, information that has come to me this year, which blows me out, is the beans that I was talking to you about, the light blue light bean, is the Elohim. I think, the, from what I understand, the Archons were once the Elohim and changed their ways... So they were almost the same, they were once the same vibration they once were the Elohim, and then now they've gone in opposite direction. It's like the bipolar opposite of the Elohim, but they were once the Elohim. Now something that happened to me when driving to Melbourne, I had an experience driving the car, and I was told that an artificial intelligence is in charge of this. I don't know what the hell that means. Since then, talking to others, they've mm -hmm. bought up artificial intelligence, AI, and I'm just right. like, don't tell me anymore because I need to get my own information, and until I've got that, then I might talk to you about it and we'll exchange stuff. Um, so this is where I'm still trying to work this out, and I don't think I ever will work it out. I just think that you, me, and everyone else has got one piece of that jigsaw yeah. puzzle, and if we all work together, we're going to put this puzzle together, but... To, to define the Archons, some of the shadow dudes are them. Um, some of these right. misty black type things are them. And yeah. there's human type ones that would look human, but at the same time, I think those human type ones are actually shapeshifters, that they can appear as anything they want to appear as. Um, I'm sure there is other types because what was weird is that how I met Anya was I rang up Mary Rodwell and I said, you're not going to believe the activity I've got going on in my house. And apparently yeah. James, had, James Gilliland had similar activity at the time, which was shadow dudes, stuff moving, black balls in the house. And she said, um, watch this video and it was Anya Briggs. And she said, this might help you because this lady uh, is mates with James wow. and it's sort of brought to light some of the issues going on at the ranch that they had going on, and it's just doing what you're supposed to be doing, these negative things pick up on it and try to stop it. And anyway, I messaged Anya on Facebook just to become a... Oh, no, I just sent her a friend's request. All of a sudden, she said, get on Skype now. I got on Skype, and she said I was on a craft with her the night before, and we got talking about this, and she brought up the Archons. And then what was funny was that months leading up to that, people kept on bringing up the Archons, and then I had an experience where the Archons were basically, they said, like, they, they didn't call them the Archons, but they'd shown what I've been dealing with uh, was basically what people are calling Archons. They've got a different term for it. I think it's just a different type of energy to what I work with up there because um, things are more thought. They're not linear or they're not, how would you say, they're way more evolved. They don't even need to talk like you and I, as you know. So... This came up out of it, but to say right. exactly what the Archon is, you know, it's like people saying the reptilians, are, uh, you know, are in charge of everything, and then I've, I once thought that, and I once thought David Icke was nuts, and now I know that's not the case. There's something behind it, and that, you know, I, now right. I actually feel right. sorry for him. The one thing that I'd like to share is one of my experiences with Shiji, and it's to show us the oneness of all, which is the best way I can explain it is that once there was a big ball of light, and all it knew was its one state. And what I wanted to do is experience, was create other realities. And it exploded half of itself up into zillions and zillions and zillions and zillions of spirits within a one frequency, like a resonant frequency it put out there. That is you, me, and everything. It was what, what is referred as source or God source or whatever people want to call it, universal consciousness. And what we left was to go and experience life and gain knowledge in every single form. So whether it's good or it's bad, we're meant to experience it. One day, all this is going to get... Like, it, as soon as something happens, it's in that frequency, it's known. But that's why we left source. So why I say this is to people, if they get something negative from it, they're not, they're not understanding what I'm saying is that we don't die. That I'm you and you're me and we're all one consciousness. And that, that's what I'd like to say about that. But I have what, – what's even weirder than an experience like that is when I've been outside the universe and I've seen other universes inside something else. That's stuff I can't handle because what I'm telling you is enough for me to handle. But that, that even showed me how much more beautiful and bigger things are than we can ever imagine. 
But that what's going on now, we're meant to be going through it. And those who are here, we've decided to be here at this time. Some of us have been trapped here because, because of karma. But those who are trapped here in karma don't realize that they can break their karma just as quick as they create it through forgiveness for themselves and of others. So it's sort of multi-layered this. I can't just... I could talk for like a week straight and still not touch the sides on, on what's going on, but there's right. a lot of stuff going on that people don't need to know as well because it would probably do their head in. And that's the type of stuff that I ponder on at right. night. There's a lot of people I've spoken yes. to in Australia here, Alfred, that don't know who you are. Um, and I've been surprised and then, then they go, oh, I've actually seen him in this documentary or, or that documentary. Now, you've, um, you went to Yale University and you actually, um, yeah, yeah. You, you graduated in uh, international law, was it? Correct. A free ebook to kind of uh, seed that concept, and exopolitics being the study of in, intelligent civilizations in the multiverse. And then that was the first time that that concept was so. That sort of gave rise, it was a meme that gave rise to a lot of activity amongst a lot of people. And then in 2005, I published an actual book. You know, I, I took that book and made it into an actual soft cover book and an ebook that was called Exopolitics, uh, Politics, Government, and Law in, in the Universe. And that book in 2005, I subsequently found out, was taken by DARPA, the Defense, Department of Defense, uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and CIA by their secret time travel technology, and they took it back to 1971, where it was seen by, uh, a, among many others, a project participant and a number of other witnesses, and the project participant subsequently was a whistleblower who told me about it in 2005. Now, the reason why that made sense to me was because back in 1971, when I was general counsel of the New York City Environmental Protection Administration, as you just stated, one of my jobs was to give talks to the public on protecting the environment. And I remember very distinctly, you know, I used to talk to all kinds of groups, being invited, this person called me up and says, yeah, can you talk to our group? I said, sure. And on the day that, that you know, of that talk, the man arrived to pick me up, and he was very much different from the normal students and housewives that I would talk to that were part of the environmental movement. He was a man in a suit, okay, looked very different from environmentalists. We got in his car, we traveled for a couple of hours, and you know, I wonder where we're going. And we arrived at this office building, and I walked in, and it was an office, big office full of about 50 other men in suits and shirts and ties, right? And they didn't look like environmentalists, because you know, you know, what an environmentalist looks like. They, you, you used to have a big, a big rock star who was a politician there in Australia, right? Who was, who was a, yeah, yeah, Peter, right, right. And, you know, uh, I mean, <laughs> there's a certain vibe around environmentalists, right? So I knew that these guys were some kind of, they were really checking me out, you know? And this was back in 1971, so yeah, yeah. I, I kept my double vision, time. right? And the main emotion that I had was cognitive <laughs> dissonance, which is that there's something here that doesn't add up. But yeah. I went ahead and just played it straight and gave my, my environmental stump speech. And during it, many of them in the room were smirking at me and trying to break me up, you know, trying to get me off my, my thing, but I, I just kept at it, and at the end, they all applauded, and they gave me a mug that said, Delaware Industrial Valley Engineers, Delaware Valley Industrial Engineers Association, which I kept, I put it in my office. Well, 
Fast forward to 2005, I was discussing with the whistleblower, Project Whistleblower, who uh, was the then uh, project participant, who then became the whistleblower who told me about that he had seen my book in 1971 in the company of two other persons, that because it had been time travel back then, and we figured out that they were CIA and Department of Defense personnel who had been briefed about my book that had been brought back in time and that I would be like a whistleblower myself about time travel and, you know, and also about the dimensional ecology and about exopolitics. What? And th maybe that I would be, you, you and I would be having this show on this day, you know, that kind of thing. And they wanted to see what I was like back then because they had seen me in the future. I call it time travel surveillance. So this is an extraterrestrials. These are terrestrials, right? Uh, yeah, who are because we're in a time space hologram. So they had achieved the capacity to to um, to go from one point A B C D in the time space hologram to E F Y G in another point and get a book and bring it Time back. Time traveling. And, and uh, which is what entry-level intelligent civilizations can do. So when I first found out about that in 2005, it really like, you know, I really went through all kinds of changes. It was like the first time that I had a multidimensional experience, which I had in February of 1973. Following? So what's this, right? Because up until that point, I've been completely, you know, rational about, you know, the 3D reality. And all of a sudden I'm talking to this enormous multidimensional being that is telling me about, about my future life, you know, what I'm going to be doing. And just two months earlier, I've been a government official. You follow what I'm saying? So, and, and so... And here it was that the CIA had a book in 1971 that I that I had just written in 1999, and that I had just published in 2005. You know, written the words in and typed those little words and edited that they had it back in 1971. It just kind of warps your mind around, which I'm sure you had many experiences because you're taken into other dimensions. So. You have to have a lot of mind flexibility, right? Well, you've you've got to be open minded, and just right. when you you're better off not thinking. Ah, oh, I understand now because the people have come to me and said, "Ah, oh, I know it all now," and it's like, right, something's going to happen in the next day that's going to knock you off your socks and make you realise you don't know it all. Because I like I had a, a friend, Susan Chance, on the show, and what she said one time was, "Expect the unexpected," and that's what I do now. I expect I expect the unexpected. I think it's the only way to be with it. And um, how did, how was that for you? Because what's happened with me is that with my experiences and with witnessing what I have, one of the hardest things for me is realizing that I've had to re-educate myself on so many levels. I've been uh, like I I I taught uh, I taught civil liberties at 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 the university le level, and and I've been very right, concerned yeah. about about constitutional rights and rights to privacy and free speech. So all of a sudden, I discover in 2005 that the Department of Defense and the CIA had had a book of mine from 1971 and that they probably have been using quantum access to hack into my private reality and track me through top secret time travel. Those guys can hack into our reality and just watch us. On time, it's like they call chronovisors. They they can just watch you on time TV. You follow what I mean? There is no more. There is no more privacy, and and now they can they can they can read your minds. So it's like you're you're giving up total privacy in this three D reality to this government that has. No legal constraints, no moral constraints. Where are the moral yeah. constraints? 
Show, show me the evidence that they have any moral constraints because they're doing genocide. I mean, I was a judge on the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Tribunal where we found Tony Blair, the Prime Minister of, of England, of the, the UK, George W. Bush, President of the United States, his cabinet guilty of the Nuremberg level uh, war crimes for the illegal invasion of Iraq where 1.5 million Iraqis were killed. Uh, civilians, you know? And, and it was all about oil. Or some people say that it, that it was also about capturing an interdimensional portal. I mean, who, who knows, right? And, and so uh, sh show me that, that those forces, those humans that are, you know, behind the levels of power, mm. they seem to be infested with our cons. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, that, that's something that I've come to myself. And, you know, like I've said before, I don't believe everything David Icke says, but I'll tell you what, a few years ago I would have thought he's nuts, and now I'm sitting here going, you know, he's right on the money about a lot of things, and not just him, but yourself and many others, because... Uh, you just couldn't do some of, you know, you just can't do this type of stuff. You just can't do it. Like, it's morally wrong. And oh, yeah. to be able to do what they've done, it's, you know, something else is at play here. <laughs> so I, I totally agree. And Australia's just as guilty. And um, there was a bloke down in, uh, Andrew Wilkie, yeah. who got in trouble um, years ago for saying that Iraq was a setup. And he's just on the news again saying that. At the time Evolve. when oh, yeah. Blair and Bush were in power, John Howard, our Prime Minister, should be copied yeah. just like Bush and Blair should be because they're all as guilty as each other. And here we yeah, go yeah, sure. now, and we've got um, bloody Syria and everything going on, hearing Polar and listening gate, to. Like Watergate. And there's a whole collective of journalists uh, who, who contribute work on an anonymous basis to a blog that we've started called Ebola Gate. And and you can just Google Ebola Gate and you'll find that blog and and it's part of the Exopolitics blogs and and yep. we just put it out there. But uh, essentially what has happened is this it's a false flag. And Ebola Gate is a very elaborate bioweapons false flag and the design of it is as follows there's a long-term plan uh, of depopulation by a uh, psychopathic elite I, I can only call it psychopathic uh, monarchical bloodline banking and corporate elite and uh, and they seem to be coming to some sort of an end game now some of their sub scenarios are like uh, they want the mineral wealth of Africa, and they're really down on the Africans, you know. And even though genetically it's shown that all of our races come from Africa, so and there there's all kinds of stuff that that there's a. Uh, you know, they say, oh, there's there's a Draco reptilian who lives in Africa now, and he's the dark king of Africa, you know, and, and he's about to, you know, I, I, I mean, yeah. you know, this gets really hairy. So the, the thing is that, is that basically this plot, because it's a false flag operation, is as follows. Uh, and it very much follows the AIDS virus. AIDS is actually a bioweapon that was invented at Fort <laughs> Detrick, Maryland. And it was seeded in Africa by U.S. Army Rangers uh, who, went, who had it embedded in the smallpox vaccine. And they went over to Africa, a supposedly a humanitarian mission to inoculate the population against smallpox. And what they were doing was, was embedding and infecting them with the AIDS virus. And then they had a series of executives of presidents in various African countries like South Africa who went along with it and said, oh, there's no such thing 
as AIDS, you know, or we can't treat AIDS, and, and you know, you shouldn't use condoms. And there's all these beliefs that you had, if you have sex with young girls, it'll cure AIDS. So that's how they've been part of the depopulation of Africa, was through the spread of AIDS. And through the Catholic Church there, they wouldn't let them use condoms. Yeah, so um, the Ebola gate, we, we call it, is actually a false flag operation. And what they're doing is they've, they've targeted West Africa, where people's health pro profiles as a population are generally low. They are, their immune systems are low, and the sanitary systems are, are, are low. And so they've developed a bioweapon called Ebola, a virus. Uh, and then uh, they have uh, implemented around it all sorts of, uh, quote, public health measures to actually accelerate the infection rate. In other words, uh, when you have an infected patient, instead of isolating the patient, they do like what they did in one of the West African countries. They quarantine the whole city so that the whole city gets infected as much as possible. And now in Liberia, they're going to have like uh, death zones where anybody who's infected gets put in that death city. And then uh, uh, there's, there's, no, there, there's no medications to treat them. And then uh, the one item that's been shown to, to be able to treat this bioweapon known as Ebola, which is massive doses of vitamin C or ascorbic acid, which is very inexpensive, that information is withheld, okay? And then there's massive propaganda. So you have, uh, you have the elements of martial law, the state, you have the elements of a bioweapon, you have the elements of a per public health industry that's trained with narrow vision where they don't tell them that not to apply the, the the vitamin C cure, and it's in countries that have no public health or practically no public health facility so that they can incubate an infected population. And they have the whole thing planned. And we have all of this at Ebola Gate, which you can go to exopolitics.com, exopolitics.blogs.com forward slash Ebola gate or go to exopolitics. And I'll have links to all that too. I'll have the links oh, up to oh, that good. at my website and where this video is posted. Oh, oh good. Great. So then you, you can just go there and they have, they have it all mapped out. And then they have the CDC and the WHO are actually part of this oper operation. They're all controlled by, uh, you know, this Illuminati force that wants to depopulate the planet. Mm -hmm. So they're all part of this. And just today, the, the WHO, World Health Organization, and the CDC came out with an announcement that by January, today, September 23rd, 2014, the number of infected people is going to be 1.25 million people, okay, 1, 2.25 million people. Right now we have 2,500 people have been killed. And if you look, and you can go to these uh, numbers and see them right there on Ebola Gate, their target is that by uh, June of 2016, this is the catastrophic timeline, June of 2016, they'll have 4.2 uh, or so billion people infected and 2.7 billion people dead. That's their, you know, it goes like this. 
ta yeah. target rate, so that they've killed off, killed us all off like cockroaches, with this bio weapon, with the you know we're we're cockroaches and they're raid, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's but it's all a scare tactic. It's like the gas chambers, and the way that they kill us is is through the vaccines. If if they because they'll they'll load all the real killing stuff in the vaccines and then uh, through Bush the two Bushes uh, uh, Clinton and Obama they did regulations in the United States now that if you, they can order you to take a vaccine and if you don't take it they they can have a soldier standing there and shoot you on sight or they can order you to a FEMA camp, which is like a concentration camp. And so it's just like totally draconian. And for example, in the Spanish flu, where 50 million people were killed worldwide right after the First World War, it turns out that that was a simp another bioweapons attack because the so-called Spanish flu was a bioweapon that was produced and was released and it and what really killed you was the vaccine what killed the 50 million was the vaccine and the aspirin that was given because uh uh both the vaccine and the aspirin the interaction of the aspirin killed killed off 50 million people and now they have it set up where if they're if they're successful they'll kill off seven billion people because their goal is to have only 500 million now they're going to fail but what we have to do is expose it and so everybody knows but they are moving it you know they're they, they have the center for disease control and they have the world health organization is putting out the propaganda and yeah. all the newspapers are broadcasting except the the Russian newspapers and the Iranian newspapers. They're the one, like Press TV just came out today with a report and said the Western nations are conducting bio-warfare against West Africa. They came out with it today. Whereas if you go to the, to the New York Times or even the age there in Melbourne, I actually lived in Melbourne for, for six months. In, 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 in 1981, uh, and I loved that city. I mean, I just really lo loved it. And, um, uh, but all of the official press is still, you know, most of it in the West is on board with what I call Ebola gate, which is mm. promoting this bioweapons false flag. So the main messages we have is, look, you can cure this stuff with vitamin C. Take a thousand uh, units of vitamin C a day, start taking it every day, and then if it starts coming in, there's levels you have to take and go to, go to the website and it'll tell you how much to take. You can even use ascorbic acid, which is much, uh, much cheaper. And uh, yeah. that that this is a total scam. It's a total scam. And they're trying to poison you with the vaccines. And uh, so far, thankfully, you know, I mean, I, I really pity those 2,500 people in, in uh, uh, West Africa that, that, that have been killed, but they're trying to terrorize us uh, with, this, with, this, with this false flag. So anyway, that that's what the the Ebola gate is. In essence, well, I think it's great you're doing what you're doing to get the information out there, and and that's what it's about is giving people another way. And like recently, I said to my father, I said if you go and look at what the Russian news is doing compared to our news, yeah, you, you've really got to look at both to come to any logical thing and do your own investigation because, you know. I don't, I don't watch telly. Uh, I didn't watch telly for months, and now I get up and watch the news headlines, and that's it. I don't yeah. even bother watching it, but it's to see what crap they're spewing to the masses for exactly. that day. Exactly. And 
because you need to know, it's sort of like you need to know your enemy. You need exactly. to know what they're going on about. And you now a lot of their stuff like 9-11 and every, you know, a lot of major things that are happening in history uh, can be undone so easily that you point some things out, just little things to the average person and it makes them wonder and that's what it's about is just not telling people what to think but just putting another format out there and if they're open-minded enough to look at it, you know, they can play their part and that's what, what this is about, that we've just got to all play our part and this is where us as humanity, uh, we can change our reality just with a thought and the more of us that do this, things are going to be coming in line where they need to come very quickly and like you say, this Ebola gate and all the other stuff they're trying to pull, it can be just pulled down. It can be dissolved just as quick as it was created just by a thought and enough of us thinking positive thoughts and having love and compassion for each other. Exactly. Exactly. Now, you've done, like you've been on some pretty major television stations as well and you do get the information out probably that they weren't expecting, I would say, because... <laughs> I'll tell you what, one day, not too long ago, it was a few months ago, I saw you on Al Jazeera, our version of Al Jazeera, but you're being interviewed by another country. I forget oh, yeah. what the issue was on, but I was stoked that you were on there because I'm going, this is what we need, someone like you to get on mainstream media, which you have done a lot in the past, to just spark a little flame in people's minds to make them think another way. And I, I think it's, it's great that you've been doing what you've been doing. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up with, uh, bring up to you is about the proposed 1977 Carter White House extraterrestrial communication study. Yeah. Um, would you mind just going, even though that's years ago, and, yeah, but I yeah, think sure. it's important, would you mind just bringing that up and, and yeah. what that involved? Yeah, sure. Uh, that involved a lot of serendipity and, and, um, uh, basically, uh, I, I, and, and I sort of like to give kind of the, kind of the full story so that people understand, uh, uh, how these things come about. And I, and I shared with you, uh, briefly the multidimensional experience that I had in February of 1973. And essentially at that night, uh, this enormous being came down upon me and I was inside of it, like inside that being. And uh, I ended up more or less being shown a motion picture of my, my, of my future life, you know. And, and for me, that was like amazing. So uh, I then uh, uh, ended up writing my first book in the extraterrestrial area in June of 1973. And, um, uh, and in the summer of, of 1976, I, I went to, to Washington and I was involved in uh, lobbying helping uh, solve uh, uh, the uh, set up a <clears throat> uh, I, I was uh, uh, went to the bay it, 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 I, I'm just trying to get all, all the facts straight in in my mind I I went to uh, uh, I was became a futurist at, um, uh, I was offered a job as a futurist at Stanford Research Institute. This was uh, over the Christmas holidays of 1976. And uh, at that time, uh, I also happened to be in Washington, D.C., because I was uh, a member of, I, I had been called there initially by Representative Henry B. Gonzalez, who was the chairman of the House Banking Committee of the House of Representatives, who had started the House Select Committee on Assassinations to investigate the assassination of John F. Kennedy 
Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and, Al and, 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 and Malcolm X. So, uh, uh, at that time, uh, President Jimmy Carter had just been elected, and he had just been elected. One of the promises that he made was that he would reopen all of the secret government UFO and extraterrestrial files. And they had sightings himself, which he, I think one oh, yeah. of them reported to move on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Publicly stated, yeah. No, no, no. And one of, the, one of the articles that people can see if they go to exopolitics.com is that we posit that President Carter is, not only had sightings himself, but he, he's actually been aboard spacecraft as an abductee. As... as an extraterrestrial abductee. That is, he, he's been taken up there. Yeah. Now, um, so, uh, while I was in Wash Washington uh, and in New York, this lawyer, this very eminent lawyer from Atlanta called me and asked to meet with me because he, he was President Carter's emissary to the investigation of John F. Kennedy of the Ken of the assassinations, which we are ongoing, and he said, "Why don't you come up for dinner?" So, I I went to this dinner that night up on Capitol Hill in Washington D.C., and we had dinner with the many of the people at the Inner Carter Circle. I I just ended up there, and. Jimmy Carter had just been elected president. This is what they call the transition period. When, yeah, yeah. when, when the, you know. And so I was sitting there with the people who are going to be working with Carter in his, in, his, in, his, in his inner circle. And I thought to myself, you know, there has never been a citizen-led, a civilian uh, scientific study of extraterrestrial communication. It's all been led by the military uh, in, in the United States history. So I thought to myself, you know, this should be done because I, I have access to these people now. I, I, you know, they, and they seem like pretty open people. And so I, over the holidays, I went to California uh, with family and it was right next to Stanford Research Institute, so I called them up, and I went up and I made a proposal. I said, I can come to you uh, to do a study on with the uh, Carter White House on extraterrestrials. And they said, okay. You know, and they offered me a job as a futurist, uh, you know, to do it. So then... I came on board as a futurist with Stanford Research Institute and began traveling to the White House in Washington and then brought the White House on board, brought the, uh, the National Institute of Science on board, brought NASA on board, and brought some scientists, key scientists on board and had the approval of the White House to go forward on this study. Uh, and was actually in the inner ring of the Pentagon when I was meeting with an assistant secretary of defense uh, in the Carter White House when I was attacked by uh, what they call electromagnetic weapons. And all of this is in my disclosure project affidavit. You know, they... they, they oh, I've actually read that. Yeah, in yeah. Uh, Dr. Gray's book, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and because the, they, they 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 try and stun you with this, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Try and try and knock me out from that mission. So then, when I got back to to Stanford Research Institute, I had everything all set. You know, all the study was ready to go forward, and then uh, I was called to a high level meeting with the vice president at Stanford Research Institute with uh uh this guy, Peter, who worked with me as a futurist and uh, with the liaison between the Pentagon and Stanford Research Institute. 
and and he said, and uh, the uh, Pentagon said, guy said, if if you go forward with this study, we're going to cancel all of the Pentagon contracts with SRI, which is about a hundred million, you know, which is about a third of their budget. Their budget was a hundred million dollars a year at that time, and that would have devastated their budget. And I said, why? He says, because there are no UFOs. <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is the Pentagon. Line. Yeah, yeah, which is, they wanted to cover up the fact that they had, they had secret human extraterrestrial liaison programs between the Department of Defense and various ET civilizations, which our project would have been un uncovered, okay? Mm. And at the same time, I was under time travel surveillance, which I didn't know at the time, by the CIA and by DARPA because of my book, right? So it was like yeah. I was walking was right, right in the middle of this crossfire of time travel surveillance, you know, the, the, uh, the secret ET liaison programs, the whole bit. So they shut the, even though it was completely approved at the Carter White House level, they shut down that program. And uh, that's when I found out about exopolitics, you know, what exopolitics is all about. It's just, it's, uh, you know, no truth and no civilians required. <laughs> That's where it all came into fruition and, and <laughs> developed from there. Um, we'll wrap it up in a little bit, but what I want to go into, mate, Mark, now is the uh, dimensional ecology of the omniverse, the, the latest book from you. Yeah. Um, I'll have links up to it as well. Would you mind giving the viewers and listeners just a quick overview and what you'd like to go into about this book? Yeah. Well, for me, you are a living example of the dimensional dimensional ecology because you're a person that's traveling the dimensional ecology of the omniverse in your living life. You're up on a ship which is in, in another dimension of the multiverse and you're you're interacting with uh, entities that are from different parts of the dimensional ecology and it belong are of different exophenotypes. So it, it's like this is wonderful. You are the living, walking embodiment of the proof of the dimensional ecology <laughs> of the omniverse. So for me, it's like, hey, you're you're a walking you testament. You want. <laughs> yeah, you're you're a walking testament. So, but basically, the the approve the 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 basic equation of the omniverse is this. Uh, the omn omniverse equals multiverse plus spiritual dimensions because the furthest that modern science, modern canonical science, that is, uh, by canonical science, I mean at the universities today. And the universities will only recognize the universes of time, space, energy, and matter. They will not recognize the afterlife. They will not recognize the human soul. They will not recognize source. And they will not let you teach about that. And I, and I know that. And they will not let you teach about exopolitics or extraterrestrials or hyperdimensionals. And I know that because I've met here in British Columbia at the high administration head of department level of the university system. And they said, Alfred, you're 10 years ahead of your time. I met with the curriculum, you know, and I saw that I was just dealing with their fears, not with reality. So we had to go found exouniversity.org, which is, you know, our university online that can handle the truth. But to get back to this, there are two scientists at Stanford University who recently published a groundbreaking scientific paper that gave an accurate estimate of the number of universes in our multiverse. And that number, they said in the paper, is so large that 
the human mind cannot comprehend it. They called it humongous. Mm. If you take, if you took, say, and tried to write out that number using 12-point type with a computer or a typewriter, that number would be more than 260 million miles long. That's how long the number of universes in the multiverse is, and we're just one of those universes. Now, just one of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, the most advanced number, this is a German estimate of galaxies in our universe. Our universe alone is 500 this billion, yep. 500 billion galaxies in our universe alone. And uh, the number of intelligently, intelligent communicating civilizations in one galaxy, uh, uh, the most conservative, this is extremely conservative. This is from the 1960 Drake equation. Yeah, and this yep. is hyper conservative is 12 civiliz communicating civilizations per galaxy when, when we know that there are at least 50 million exoplanets, planets like Earth in our galaxy mm -hmm. alone. Okay, so it like, doesn't make any sense, but we're going to say, oh, there are only 12, right? So e even if we go with this artificially low number of 12, there are 12 like 500 billion intelligent civilizations in our universe. But that's probably nowhere near... It's near probably, what it really is. Yeah, it's probably more like 150 to 100 billion, 50 to 100 million times 500 billion intelligent civilizations in our universe alone. So those are like the real numbers. You know, yeah. and uh, if you take let let me just get some of these numbers because I, I just want to get them accurately. Uh, yeah. These are um, I'll just bring them right here. Uh, uh, so uh, I just want to get them accurately uh, so that people, you know, so that people see what the attitudes are right now. Um, uh for example, there, if we look at the public opinion polls, the U.S., this is a U.S. public opinion poll, they said that 37% of the U.S. adults affirmed a belief in the existence of extraterrestrials, 21% <coughs> denied a belief, and 42% are uncertain. So it basically... You have a little over 60% saying there are no extraterrestrials and I'm not sure, or under 40% saying, oh, I believe it. Yep. And here's in the United States, and which is an educated country, and compare that with the number of extraterrestrials, the number of, of universes in the omniverse, and the number of extraterrestrial civilizations in our universe alone, <coughs> which is 500 billion, the number of galaxies, times, you know, somewhere between 12 and 500 million, <laughs> okay? It's like, wait a minute, how can that be so low? Now, another, this is world ET opinion. A 2010 poll by the French market research company Ipsos, a world public opinion and extraterrestrials, found that one in five, 20% of human adults surveyed in 22 countries representing 75% of the world's GDP. These are like the, the, these are like the G20, right? The, yeah. the more advanced country. Say that they believe aliens have come down to Earth and, and, and walked among us. <coughs> so that's that 
Only 20% believe that. With, with all, you know, with, with, the with all of that, with all of that, only 20% b believe that of the G20. By contrast, of the BRICS countries, India and China, India 45% believe that, and China 42% that believe that. They're the most likely to believe that extraterrestrials um, uh, have, uh, have, uh, have come to Earth. And uh, just to fast forward uh, uh, a little bit, let me see if I can get this, because I think it's, because the other part of the omniverse is, is, the, is the spiritual dimensions, and the spiritual dimensions constitute, co co consist of, um, uh, co consist of the intelligent, civilization of souls, spiritual beings, and source. And uh, we have now have rep replicable uh, empirical evidence that the intelligent civilization of souls exists. And wh what happens is that the entire spiritual dimension, the souls and the spiritual beings and, and the and God, and actually the story that you told corresponds to, to the science. God is thought of as a sea of light, and the souls that are produced in that kind of a mass production process are thought of as eggs of light. So it's very much what, what we, we're sort of, our souls are like holographic eggs of light, fragments of light. So the hologram principle that contained is, all of it like a hologram yeah, it's yeah. a bit of a hologram contains if you cut it out it contains the whole of the exactly. original hologram yeah yeah, yeah 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 exactly so that all of us the souls spiritual beings and god participate in creating all of the universes of the multiverse and all of the planets and all of this, all of the civilizations in it and that's how we spend a lot of our time between incarnations. We go around and we tweak time and we tweak the planets and we tweak all, all the different beings and we tweak the civilizations. Then for soul development, we'll come in and we'll incarnate. And as you said, we don't have to incarnate just, you know, as a human on Earth. We can incarnate simultaneously on Earth in another dimension of something else. You know, because our, our souls can, can can multitask. Now, here here is some some very interesting data. Again, according to a twenty eleven Ipsos poll taken in twenty three nations, that's the G twenty, one half of global citizens definitely believe in a divine entity, fifty one percent compared to 18% who don't and 17% who aren't sure. So here we have the, the, the uh, G20, where ha only half of the G20 believes that there's a divine entity, whereas we have this enormous omniverse with intelligent civilization of souls that's huge with, you know, a humongous number of universes with this whole thing going on, and in the G20 countries on our planet, only half believe that that's going on, and the rest of them just don't even know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, there, there's a high degree of ignorance about the nature of reality, is what I'm saying. Okay, afterlife. The Ipsos poll also found that 51% believe in some kind of afterlife, while the remaining half believe they will a actually cease to exist, 23%, or simply don't know. 23% or 26% don't know. So that's a huge, you see, they're tremendously underinformed. I mean, here's a central part of our existence is that we incarnated here and we go through this temporal existence, and then the minute our body drops away, we go back to the interlife. I mean, this is a whole, this is a virtual experience for soul development. Half the population doesn't even know that, 
and a quarter of the population thinks that we cease to exist. I mean, they're being kept deliberately ignorant, which hampers their soul development, is my point. Reincarnation, only 7% of the, G, of the G20 believe in reincarnation. That's how the whole system is set up. It's set up around reincarnation in all these humongous number of universes and all these quadrillion of souls. It's set up in reincarnation and only 7% believe in it. Talk about underinformed. See, this is the role of the religions. They have underinformed and also science. The universities have prohibited teaching the scientific versions of the afterlife, of reincarnation and what happens. And what we've done in this new book, The Dimensional Ecology of the Omniverse, is put together all of the science, the replicable science of, uh, of reincarnation, Dr. Ian Stevenson, you know, just the basic science. How is the omniverse constructed? How's the multiverse? How's the universe? What is the soul? What's the basic process? of the intralife, what happens when a soul goes through the interdimensional portal at the core of the intralife and teleports, because telepathy and teleportation are the two core technologies of the omniverse. Souls teleport and telepathically communicate. Extraterrestrials teleport and telepathically communicate. That's the basic technology of getting around. A soul that's going to incarnate goes to the interdimensional portal between the, the intralife, the afterlife, and teleports right up to the womb of the mother in a normal birth, about three months prior to birth, and then enmeshes itself into the fetus of the mother, and then comes out and then leads that life. But that, and, and then goes into some set of forgetfulness, although an advanced being like yourself, a gifted one, has that, you know, memory. And <clears throat> uh, uh, so this is a, tr so part of the, part of the recommend, you know, so this book, what we've done is just ha have it there available as a kind of as a correction tool, as an educational tool. So people, because we have to bring science back to an area that that superstition, belief, and errors, you know, in these scientific, in these bit like biblical texts, is filled with errors, and you know, to try and correct yeah. it. So that's basically what 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 the book is. Now it's great right that you've done it because you know. We we had gone through a period of that, and then it dropped off, and it's coming back to that again. Where we've got to bring, we've got to have a balance between spiritual um, evolution and our spirit side and technology. Yeah, and yeah. With science, we need to have that balance, and we can't um, have it out of whack because yeah. it's an injustice for us all, and it's, we're not going to develop how we could if we had that balance. So it's great that you're getting all these worlds, the afterlife, source, and science, and ETs, and everything, and ramming it all together, and, you know, putting the evidence where you can, and the studies where you can, to go with, uh, you know, the way it is, the way I see it anyway. Great, great, yeah. And th this is a time of the integration of science and spirituality. So, this is very much in, in the spirit of, you know, this is... As you said, this is exactly how how it how it should be cut happening, and um, so actually, I I was in some great measure awakened and set on my path by a multidimensional experience that was very powerful, uh, and and that is sort of what has given me my ground of being, and. A multi-dimensional perspective is one that I come from, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and so I try to integrate both the multi-dimensional perspective, and then try to integrate it into the terrestrial science. You know, like the disciplines of Earth, so that yeah. 
it can it can it can ingrain itself into the educational system, you know, so that people yeah. can it can it can work here on Earth. So that that's kind of the way that I approach things. Now that's good. That's fantastic. And what we'll do, we'll wrap it up there. Okay. Um, I want to keep in touch too, but I just want to uh, say thanks for having me on your show and thanks for being on my show. Oh, listen, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you know, it's um absolute privilege and honor to be talking to you and for taking the time out to to chat. Thank, thank you, 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 you as well. And I, I have such respect and and I feel such honor being in your presence because you are communicating with other dimensions and with other beings that are that are so evolved up there and and in a sense you are doing it for all of us and you are representing us so you are a messenger back to us and so it's all it's all working it's it's good Yep, now nah, we're all into this together, as I say. We've all got to, you know, do our little bit. So <laughs> I couldn't do it without you and vice versa. We've all just got to do our little bit. <laughs> Great. Okay. All right, mate, we'll wrap it up there, and, and thanks again. Sure enough. Take, take care then. Okay, bye-bye.